All right, everyone. Well, uh, today we do want to talk a little bit about the infection prevention program and how to develop a plan, how to kind of get it going. Um, next slide, please. All right, so we're going to, of course, cover the regulatory requirements when it comes to the infection prevention control program. Uh, kind of go through the components of that program, then talk about the steps to really develop and implement that program, including what should be included in that ICP plan, the IPC plan. And then of course, just go over some resources um, that I've put together for you to develop and really implement your program. Next slide, please. All right, uh, so in terms of regulatory requirements, so um, of course, you know, back in 2016, uh, there was a big mega rule, the big mega final rule, whatever you want to call it for as far as federal goes, uh, 42 CFR 483. Um, and of course, that came out in 2016, and it was uh, put in different phases, and uh, that was for infection control, the last phase went into effect at the end of November of 2019. Little did we know then, that little did we know then that, you know, of course we'd be dealing with COVID in 2020. Um, and of course, whenever the the um, whenever this rule came out, there were there were originally just um, up to the F tags were F. Uh, 880 all the way to 883, but then of course, um, after COVID, there were some additional rules and additional things that were added in terms of uh, reporting to NHSN, uh, reporting to resident family, all you know, things that had to do with uh, COVID. So now there's actually um, these eight different tags um, that have to do with the federal rule. Um, so of course that has to do with um, CMS and CMS certification, but uh, all of these, all of this pretty much was also put into law um, for uh, nursing facilities. And that was under the Texas Health and Safety Code under Chapter 242 and Subchapter K, uh, K, where it discusses quality of care and the standards for quality of life and quality of care. And uh, of course, no law in Texas, uh, probably any other state, uh, is uh, lives by itself because the laws are broad. And in order to really provide the meat of the law, how things are gonna be done, uh, that is the, under the administrative code. And so um, the law really comes to life in the Texas Administrative Code um, with Title uh, 26, Part 1, Chapter 554, Subchapter Q, when it comes to infection control. Uh, and this, I put links to all the rules <clears throat> related to infection control. Of course, there have been some emergency rules that um, they keep, they've been extended out in terms of COVID. And then there's some related um, Texas Administrative Code uh, in terms of the QAA, QA committee, and also uh, doing a facility assessment. So those are, they're all kind of related. So I've included that, um, those legal requirements and those codes as well. Next chapter. Okay, so when we talk about the law, um, here in Texas, when it applies to infection control, this TAC rule 554.1601, um, um, there are, of course, things that have to be uh, put into place per the law. And, and again, they mirror um, what CMS uh, indicates. So, uh, of course, you have to have an infection prevention and control program that is reviewed annually at a minimum. Of course, anytime there's an outbreak, anything happens, uh, it's supposed to be re reviewed again. Um, and it's supposed to be monitored by the QAA, the QAPI committee, um, and it should be also based on a, the facility assessment. So um, it should be part of that bigger facility assessment. And they make it very clear that it really needs to be a system for um, identifying, reporting, investigating, and controlling communicable diseases. And they make it very clear. It's not just the residents, it's residents, staffs, volunteers, visitors, and any other individuals providing services under a contractual agreement. So um, it's not just the residents, it's not just the staff, it's really all people who have any type of contact with the facility. Of course, the program has to follow national, you know, nationally accepted standards. Um, so that obviously is typically things like CDC, CMS, uh, HRQ, things that are national standards. And of course, everything has to be in written policy or procedure form for every single component um, that is required under law um, for the infection prevention control program. Next slide. 
So what are those program requirements per, per TAC? Um, so the program requirements include, of course, you have to have a communicable disease surveillance system, you know, a way to identify any communicable diseases that may be going on in your facility in terms of, again, for resident staff or other, for anybody who has contact with the facility. Um, you have to have a reporting system for communicable diseases. So who, if, if there is a communicable disease, when are you going to report it? Uh, what's the, the nature, the timeliness, uh, to whom are you going to report that to, um, so that you need to have that component. They, of course, indicate you have to have standard and transmission-based precautions, um, and then when and how someone will be placed into isolation. Um, you have to indicate the type of isolation and the duration, and um, they make it very clear that it needs to be the least restrictive possible, which I thought, you know, that was, you know, of course, that's written in the original um, law um, pre-COVID, pre but it's supposed to be as least restrictive as possible. Uh, and then do you have to make sure you have employee restrictions and assessments. So when our, when employees are sick, when employees, um, you know, are coming into your facility, how are you assessing them? That was actually back from the 2019 law, but of course we do that now with COVID as well. Hand hygiene procedures, that has to be part of the the IPC program and antimicrobial uh, antibiotic stewardship as well. Next slide. Uh, the program also has to have a way to uh, report incidents, any incident that happens, um, and then what type of corrective action. So if there was an exposure, if something happened in the facility, what, you know, how are you reporting that? And then how are you ensuring that there's a corrective action taken to prevent any type of incident from occurring? Um, acceptable accommodations for a residence with communicable disease. So that, again, that has to be part of the, the um, program. Um, tuberculosis risk assessment and screening. Um, vaccination per risk level to the residents and recommendations. Um, they specifically mention pneumococcal, influenza vaccinations, and hepatitis B. They say that they are required, but they also make it very clear that any uh, anybody can object um, can de decide not to take uh, to take any of these vaccines for you know any reason pretty much um, that they feel if they they don't want to take uh, the vaccine but it's something that has to be documented and then the last part is in terms of linen storage you know how the pro the processing of linens and the transportation of linens so those per tack are all components that need to be in an infection prevention control program for uh, nursing facilities. Next slide. So how do we even begin, you know, knowing that these are the components? Yes, this is, we need to have a, a program. It needs to have these components. How do we even begin to get started? Or if you're new into a facility, this is, th these are the questions I commonly get asked is somebody's brand new to facility. They've either never worked infection control or they're new to the nursing home setting or they were a nurse, but they never did infection control. So, you know, where did, you know, they're, they're taking over the program from somebody else and they just have all of this stuff. They don't know where to begin. Um, so the first step is really to make sure um, that you're either reviewing or doing a risk assessment, because that really is the cornerstone of the program. Um, so that again, needs to be done at least annually, and it should be done in conjunction with the facility wide assessment. So, um, whenever you're doing this risk assessment, it's not just you know the risk in terms of the facility, but also community-wide hazards. So um, anything that you know we talked about earlier, uh, I did a presentation on multi-drug resistant organisms. We talked about C. aureus and how we are seeing uh, C. aureus. There was uh, there were uh, outbreaks of C. aureus in nursing facilities in Texas and in North Texas. That should be part of that um, of that community-wide hazards that you need to consider. And of course, it should include regulatory and licensing requirements, um, your, you know, your assessment. Um, there's so many, there's different approaches to, you know, how are you going to do this risk assessment? There's no um, defined way, like you must do the risk assessment using this particular form. Um, but you can do an ICAR, um, which is provided through CDC. Uh, and, but there's a lot of all hazards kind of approach uh, different templates. Um, some include, again, the general CDC ICAR. There's a really good site, and I put links here, but I also have some resources I'll share at the end. 
Um, there's a SPICE long-term care risk assessment tool that I really like. And of course, you can always do the CMS long-term care self-assessment. Now, I always recommend that you do a more of an all hazards type of risk assessment, like the SPICE LTC risk assessment tool. And then the others, like the ICAR and the other self-assessment are really more for check-ins to see how you're doing. Um, I, I don't recommend you use that as the primary way of doing a risk assessment, but it is a, there are definitely very good tools to uh, do rounding and to do periodic check-ins on that plan. Next slide. So this is what that um, risk assessment tool looks like. Um, again, I've provided the link and it's also in some of the resources I'm gonna provide. Um, they look at it and they have different, you know, in external and internal factors. Um, and, you know, you start putting in different types of events based on things that have happened in your facility, or maybe, uh, of course, you always want to begin with any deficiencies you may have had during survey, anything like that needs to go in there, anything regulatory. And then you uh, are going to give it a different ranking um, based on the probability of occurrence, the uh, risk level of failure, uh, any potential change in care and then preparedness. And you're going to um, go in and give it a score. And then based on that score, you're going to say, these are going to be my top priorities um, for this upcoming year um, to make sure that we're doing ongoing um, measures uh, for this particular area of the factory control plan. Next slide. Okay, so then, okay, so we talked about the risk assessment. What exactly needs to be in the risk assessment? I just showed you a template, but you wanna always make sure, again, regardless of what tool you're using, again, I recommend doing that bigger uh, scale kind of risk assessment, but you wanna definitely make sure it has characteristics of uh, the resident population, any healthcare needs, um, infection risk in the community. Um, we were talked about anything that's gonna affect uh, the facility itself, staff, residents, uh, any type of invasive medical devices that are being used uh, and how often they're used, you want to make sure and include that. Um, baseline uh, infection rates for the facility. Again, if you're using any invasive medical devices, you want to make sure and include that. A any immunization activities in the facility, and that includes not just the number of people that are vaccinated and including that information, but also any immunization promotion campaigns that are done in the facility. Um, as well. So not just, uh, you know, hey, this is, a, we'll talk about this about outcome and process surveillance, but not just the outcome of yes, this is how many people are, have, have uh, received immunizations, but also what is it that we're doing as far as process measures to really try to promote immunizations. Next, please. Um, also, you, of course, you want to always include in your risk assessment, anything that has to do with hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is always a big, big factor. Um, and, you know, looking at policies, procedures, compliance um, in terms of staff, visitors, and residents. And then the uh, implementation of any transmission-based precautions, um, you know, how often they're used, uh, any barriers, you wanna make sure and include measures in your plan that have to do with uh, transmission-based precautions. Antimicrobial stewardship, um, you know, do you have a program? How, you know, what is going on with your program? Um, process for cleaning and disinfection, and that includes different types of surfaces, um, things that are being used by residents, things that are hard and the soft surfaces throughout the facility, uh, and then also an emergency preparedness plan. Now, some people have this as a different plan, but you want to make sure that in the infection prevention control plan with the risk assessment portion that you are considering if there was, of course, outbreaks, that's an emergency, um, but also if there were natural or man-made disasters, how, you know, what are some factors you have to consider in preventing infections? Um, so, uh, for example, once I, you know, was uh, working at a facility and they had, a, they had some flooding and um, they had uh, where they kept a lot of their, where they kept a lot of their equipment and they kept a lot of their um, gowns, gloves, things like that, that area got mildew. It just got, you know, got mildewy. And so then it was like, well, what, what was the plan in terms of, you know, can we still use these items? Uh, do we have to throw them out? Is there a way that we can assess them? Um, so those are things that you kind of have to start thinking about if there were uh, infection control issues, if there was a type of natural man-made disaster. Next slide. All right, so the next step, okay, so you've done your, um, you've done your risk assessment, you know, uh, you wanna make sure and include all those 
components we talked about, and then you're going to score them and say, okay, these are going to be, you know, they're all important, but these are going to be my focus areas. Um, but you definitely want to make sure you're developing or updating in your infection prevention plan in terms of policies and procedures for all of those components that you have some mention of it. Now, um, you're going to make sure that, yes, you have those policies and procedures in place for all those uh, components that are in that risk assessment that, again, are part of that bigger program. Um, and then based on the score, that's what you're really going to focus on at the very end more on sustainment. But you want to make sure, again, you're having policies and plans uh, that that really cover all of those aspects in your risk assessment. Um, that's going to, again, those policies and plans are going to come from the risk assessment, regulatory requirements, any corporate goals or requirements. Um, again, I've given you a pretty good template here of a policy sample, something you could use. Um, most facilities, especially if they're you know, owned by larger corporations, they have their own template, but this is just a nice template to help get you started uh, and a good, good one for comparison. Next, please. Okay, so then what else, you know, so what else should be in that plan, right? Of course, as I mentioned, it needs to have all of the, so your plan that includes all those policies, procedures. Um, of course, it has to have all the components of the IPC program, uh, your risk assessment, and you also want to make sure it also includes the roles and responsibilities of the facility staff, including the IP. Um, I've seen this a lot in um, when I would go and we would do public health ICARs, that this was always a, a gap in, um, in, the, in, the, in the procedures. There would be something that would be written as to who the roles and responsibilities would be, especially when it came into, you know, came to disinfection, cleaning and disinfection. The policy would say one thing, but then what was done on the floor was something completely different. Everyone, th everyone thought some, everyone else did did something. They're like, oh well, no, you know, we don't do this. Somebody else does it. So um, that's really important to make sure that's in there. Um, environmental, the, anything that has to do with environment, environmental cleaning and disinfection. So that includes, you know, terminal cleaning procedures for isolation rooms, um, sanitizing, you know, multiple use equipment and supplies. Kitchen sanitation and food safety, this is another gap. Sometimes we don't see this um, in the infection control uh, policies, things that have to do with kitchen sanitation and safety in terms of the infection, the role of the infection preventionists in this. Um, and then uh, also a water management program. So water management program, it really has to do with the, uh, with Legionella, Legionellosis. Um, so we do see, uh, you know, prior to COVID, I would say uh, this was a big focus of CDC and, and the state of Texas on Legionella because we did see quite a few cases of Legionnaire's disease uh, in nursing homes that had to do with uh, air conditioning systems or water systems that weren't being maintained properly. So it was a big push uh, right before COVID. And then of course COVID happened and kind of fell off the radar, but this water management program as well. Uh, identification management of outbreak of infectious diseases. Uh, of course, that includes any reporting to state or local uh, local authorities as required by statute. Next, please. Of course, uh, and so, so some facilities, the infection prevention and the occupational health, it depends on the facility. Sometimes it's all rolled into one role, sometimes it's separated. Um, but you want to make sure you have things that have to do with worker safety and occupational health, all those things that have to do with handling and disposing of biohazardous waste, single use equipment, collection and handling of lab specimens, of course, that leads to a bloodborne pathogens um, standards, um, making sure that that's being managed, screening of new hires, um, again, occupation, just again, depending on the facility, sometimes IP does this, sometimes it's a separate occupational health area um, that deals with screening, um, education and training, very important. And then of course, sick leave, reporting infectious disease illnesses, any type of work restrictions that needs to be in there. Um, reporting and notification. So that just, in, that includes internal and external. So reporting in terms of like we see with that, with the COVID-19 F tag, you know, are you notifying um, families, residents, when there's cases, what's going on? That's, that needs to be all part of that uh, plan of those policies. And then uh, planning for internal and external disaster situations. Again, as I mentioned, um, you have to think kind of, you know, what would be the role of infection prevention if there was a disaster uh, outside of, of an outbreak? 
Next slide, please. All right, so then you know you've done your you've done your risk assessment, you've put together your policies and procedures to make sure it covers all of the components of the risk assessment, the program um, components that are required by law. And so now you're gonna need to do ongoing surveillance. Um, so that's gonna obviously need to make sure that it is a system as you know, what's required in the law that you have to have a system, that it's gonna be timely, accurate, and it's gonna help be helpful for useful trend detection. Um, and, and you use this surveillance to really help select the infection prevention control interventions for improvement um, to make sure that you're keeping track. Again, you're, when you do your risk assessment, you're going to identify you know, your top three, top five risks and say, hey, these are the really, you know, these are my highest risks. These are things, you know, they're all important, but these are the ones that, you know, given my time and resources, these are the ones I'm gonna put uh, the most emphasis on so that you're keeping track and keeping a progress on those, um, those highly ranked um, risks from that risk assessment. And of course, this is an ongoing, team effort, you know, it's always, it's not just the, the infection preventionist or the person who's given the infection prevention hat to do all this uh, as, as terms of ongoing surveillance. Um, it really is a team effort. You need to have a lot of administrative, you know, administration support. You know, have, you need to have the uh, healthcare providers who are your cheerleaders. You have to have, of course, CNAs that are involved and even families and residents who can be, be involved as well. And you have to be out on the floor. Um, you have to actually do rounding and see what's going on. Um, lots of times, you know, I'll see uh, people who are new to the infection prevention role, and um, especially if they're clinicians, they're you know nurses. That's their background, and um, they are used to looking, you know, being on the floor as clinicians and bedside caretakers. So this is you know kind of a different way to look at it to make sure that they're doing infection control rounding. Um, and you know, of course, that it's not punitive in any way, but it's really about process improvement, building those relationships. You do have good process improvement. Next slide. So what are some different surveillance methods? Um, we just talked about process surveillance. So those are things that are gonna be, are you keeping track of hand hygiene? Are you monitoring hand hygiene? Transmission-based precautions, environmental cleaning, those are usually the big ones. You know, are you monitoring that? What, you know, because ultimately those are the processes that are going to have an effect on the outcomes, right? Of healthcare associated infections and infections in the facility. And of course, um, out, any outbreak surveillance or uh, do you have some type of ways in your facility to make sure that you are able to, to if there was a multi-drug resistant organism outbreak, could you identify it? Um, flu, COVID, obviously, GI things such as, you know, norovirus. Um, you know, I know one facility, uh, we did a, uh, we did an outbreak and it was, it had to do with scabies. Um, and that was, you know, that was something that they had to, you know, add into their risk assessment. And, you know, how are they, how are they going to consider this in the future? And then, of course, outcomes, you know, what are the outcomes? Sometimes, you know, depending on the facility, UTIs are big outcome, multi-drug resistant organisms, C. diff. These are the things. So I you know we're used to using NHSN for COVID, uh, for all things COVID, but NHSN does have um, routine long-term care modules as well. And these are some of the outcomes that they look at as well. So you can use that system for um, to be able to track those outcomes as well. And um, you want to make sure you are using standard surveillance def definitions. And um, this is a question or maybe a comment I should say that I get all the time that I would have providers that would say, well, this person, you know, doesn't have a UTI or this person doesn't clinically, they don't, I don't, I don't agree they have X, Y, Z. And it would be important to say, well, you know, there's a difference between clinical definitions and criteria and surveillance criteria. Um, maybe clinically you don't feel that they meet the um, UTI criteria, but for surveillance purposes, anybody who meets these criteria, they meet this surveillance criteria. That doesn't mean that you have to treat them any differently clinically, but they do meet the surveillance definition. And so it's just for ease of tracking to make sure that we are tracking and reporting things. Um, and of course, in a nursing facility, it's really mainly just for tracking purposes to make sure it's standard because, you know, again, it's, it, it does tend to be more standard than the clinical criteria. And there's different um, ways, there's different um, surveillance definitions that are out there. Of course, we're, I think now we're used to NHSN. That tends to be more perspective. You can use the system to perspectively kind of keep an eye on things. And then there's a um, McGree uh, criteria as well that tends to be used more retrospectively, but it's out there as well. 
All right, so then the last step, right? So you're round, so you've done your, uh, you've done your risk assessment, you've put together your policies and procedures, you're rounding, um, you're keeping track of surveillance, especially those things that were marked as high risk in your risk assessment. Um, and then of course, you need to make sure that you're doing assessment and communication. So that has a lot to do with the QAA and QAPI, um, the Quality Assessment and Assur and, uh, Assurance and Assessment Committee, and of course, putting in a QAPI plan um, for process improvement. You know, So you do identify an issue, how are you going to improve it? How are you going to make sure those things that are rated as high, you know, high risk um, if there's factors that you can control, how can you try to lower that risk uh, and make sure that you are tracking it? Um, and of course, communications, you know, you want to make sure that I think that lots of times we think, oh, well, you know, the QAPI committee does what, you know, the QA committee does. Um, but many times that's not really um, the, the residents, the family, the staff, they're sometimes they're not as um, they're not part of it um, as much as they could be. Um, so you want to make sure that information's out there and you want to make sure, of course, you know, the infection prevention program is under the QAA committee. So you want to make sure that uh, that is being reported to the QAA and all of that information is given out uh, in general throughout the facility so that it is clear that there is infection prevention control program in this facility and that the facility, again, it's not perfection, it's progress. The the facility is constantly working towards making progress in infection prevention goals. And of course, communications in terms of external uh, regulatory licensing, public health, you always want to make sure that that's um, that you're communicating if there are any issues, anything that um, any problems you see or whenever you need assistance. Um, we've I know when I worked in public health, we had a lot of facilities that would reach out and say, hey, I, you know, I'm having this issue in my facility. Can you guys come out and help us? Um, you know, with, you know, kind of seeing how, how can we improve in this process. So they would invite us in to, you know, to provide some feedback um, as well as public health. I, mean, I never worked regulatory, so it wasn't regulatory, it was just as a public health epidemiologist to provide that information. Next, please. <clears throat> So the key points is, yeah, the infection, preven uh, infection prevention program, it has to be uh, assessed as part of the bigger facility assessment. Um, there are many components to an IPT program. Um, and you have to, of course, consider the not just the facility, but also community risks when you're uh, thinking about the components and the risks uh, as well. And that it is, it's just an ongoing systematic process of development and implementation of that program. So it's not something that you know, once a year, you do a risk assessment, you update your plans, and it goes on the shelf, you know, the IP plan, and then we go, oh, we're done. You know, it needs to be an ongoing, systematic way of, of making sure that you are making progress, that you are keeping tabs of infection prevention in that facility. Next, please. All right, so I provided some um, resources, and of course, this is where all, all my references are. Um, to assist with developing and cre creating this uh, IPC program, I put a link to a Google Drive for that we have for the Tarrant County Infection Prevention Council. So I chair this council, uh, and it is if you uh, click on this link, it will take you to our Google Drive, and you can download um, some really good resources. The first is the APIC IP Guide to Long Term Care. So usually this book costs about 100 bucks. Um, APIC provided it free of charge uh, early in the pandemic, and so I'm providing it to you. So you have this resource. It is a really great resource. It covers a lot of detail on, uh, you know, really how to implement infection prevention uh, in, in long-term care. The other thing is some resources and template, like ch checklists that you may, you could use in Excel. And then some QIO infection prevention control action plan templates. So I don't know, if, Jesse, if you could bring those up. I just wanted to show the people on the call. Are you able to see this? Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's, I, well, I don't know if it's going to work because it's saying to update your browser and just. Yeah, I'm not sure that. We're on edge instead of Chrome. Well, you... well, um, what we could do is, um, Jesse, if you let me show my screen or share share my screen, I could show them real quick. Yeah, I, th I think Jesse okay. may be able to share hers. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. I'm just. Can you see it, my? Screen? It should work now. Yeah. Okay. 
So it does, so this is the book I mentioned. Again, it's a really great book. Uh, if you were to buy it online right now, the same edition, it's over hundred dollars. So uh, it's a great resource. I provided uh, again, APIC provided for free for long-term care facilities early in the in the uh, pandemic. So of course, I just made sure to save it so I could I could get get that information out to anybody who needs it. Um, the other thing is this uh, IPC resources. If you see here, the first tab is different resources, different links to all sorts of tools that you can use for assessments. I put that all in there. And then within the book, they had different checklists. So that's included as well in this Excel format so that you can um, go in and make any changes that you want. You can use these tools and it has them for, you know, how do you review the program, the IPC program, and about uh, antimicrobial and antibiotic stewardship program, just different IPC audits that you can use. So it has a lot of, of good resources there and you can go ahead and make any changes that you want to them. And then the last thing is um, this infection prevention control action plan template. Um, you can see here, there's different topic areas um, and there's a worksheet within that folder for all of these topic areas. It talks about, you know, obviously how can you go in, for, for example, the topic area of infection control surveillance, you know, how can you um, strengthen your infection control surveillance? What are some root causes, some issues that you can um, look at for areas of opportunity? So that's also uh, in those resources. So let me unshare my screen here. All right, so that's basically, so that's it. That's kind of an overview of the infection prevention control plan. So I'll leave, actually, I'm gonna, I guess Susie was gonna talk next about the next step on quality control, quality assurance, and all things on sustain, uh, sustaining the IPC program. Sounds great, thanks so much. Hello everyone, so it's great to be with you all here today. Um, so as Dr. Cervantes mentioned, um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about quality improvement. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So in terms of our objectives for today, um, we're really just gonna talk about how to really seamlessly integrate quality improvement into your infection prevention efforts. This is kind of the easiest way to do it. Um, we're going to walk through a real real world example. I always feel like it's much easier to sort of get your arms around it when we sort of share a sample. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And that project's going to focus on really thinking about or how to identify emerging trends in infection prevention. Um, and then we are going to touch a little bit on action planning and sustainability. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, so really, in terms of improvement, um, it's just a great idea to integrate quality improvement into your overall pro program. So we talked a little bit already about assessing your program, um, and this is really when you want to kind of think about in integrating quality improvement. So once you've completed that assessment, um, you want to think about sharing those results with your copy team. Um, and really a great way to approach this is to start by focusing really on those wins or what is going well. So we always wanna make sure that we're highlighting those successes and thinking about how we can expand those or even you know, continue those or uphold those successes. Um, then you wanna think about kind of where your challenges lie. So this is an area that I think we all have challenges in um, and I think it's something that is constantly evolving and changing. So um, something um, you know, really to kind of think about is ways to improve. Um, and, and we often have a lot of challenges. So I think one way to really kind of think about this is how to prioritize those challenges. Um, I usually like to focus on the, an area that has a lot of bang for the buck. So starting with something that's relatively easy to implement, but that really has a big impact on improving your infection control. Um, and then finally, you want to think about who you want to work on the improvement. Um, and so I think we mentioned, uh, you know, having those folks involved, a multidisciplinary team is really important. Um, it might be a small team if it's a small project. Um, you may want to have a larger team, but really include all those, um, all those areas that are important. So infection prevention is obviously important. You might want to consider a physician champion, a nurse champion, a frontline champion. That frontline champion is really, really important. That person, you know, can really inspire others and educate peers by modeling the change. Um, so I think that person is really critical in terms of, of your planning. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so really in terms of quality improvement, the first thing you want to do is identify a framework for improvement. 
Um, there's a lot of them out there. You probably have one that you're familiar with. Um, I really like the PDSA model. Um, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because I'm sure you guys have heard it before, but um, the thing I like about the PDSA model is that it's really a, a model that you can do pretty quickly um, with a rapid cycle. So sometimes you're looking at a three month sort of cycle. It's really easy to follow. Um, having worked in operations, I feel like quality improvement needs to be, it moves quickly and fastly and you need to be able to implement and test and move on. So um, there's really four easy steps. First, you make a plan, which really means that you're just identifying what you want to accomplish. Um, then you want to execute the plan, analyze your results, um, and then based on whatever you see within your test, you want to figure out, you know, is this something that we want to continue with or is this something that we need to maybe modify or did it not work at all to do something else? So next slide, we're going to go ahead and walk through an example project. Um, okay, so on this slide, this is kind of the plan phase, which is the first step. And this is where you really want to be diligent about how you're going to test this change. This is likely where, where you're, you'll spend most of your time, um, but it's a good spend of time. So you want to kind of think about who will be involved, um, what will be tested, when it will be tested, where it will be tested, as well as any data that you're thinking that you'll need to assess your results. Um, so in this example, our team is trying to be a little bit more proactive about identifying emerging trends that impact infection control. Um, so these could include things like staffing issues or supply amounts or status or notifications of health department criteria, you know, kind of any of those things. And so in order to do this, they found a tool that they felt like would help them do some environmental rounds. So this tool really prov provides a checklist of areas to review. Um, if you've already done sort of your assessment and there are specific areas where you're challenged, you might want to focus on those areas, but really just kind of having a standardized approach is important. Um, so then within this test, in this example, the team is going to be led by the infection preventionist, um, and that person will do daily rounds using this task list. Um, she's going to perform these rounds and do tests on both the day and night shift. So it's really important to kind of cover all areas or as much as you can cover within the amount of time that you have for testing. Um, in this example, we limited the location to um, what is a made up second floor in a facility. Um, when you're thinking about testing changes, um, I feel like it's a little bit, um, it might be a good approach to make it a little bit more manageable. So sometimes small samples are manageable. Um, but we always want to make sure that it's a representative sample. Um, and then finally, you want to think about what data you'll collect. And so in this example, we're tracking the number or percentage of issues identified, um, as well as the actions taken. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So these are the final three phases of the project. Um, and so in the due phase, uh, we'll simply complete what we just kind of discussed. Um, in the study phase, we would want to discuss our findings with our coffee team, um, as well as any other stakeholders within our organization or external to our organization um, that participated in the test. Um, and then finally, we might want to think about either going ahead and implementing the change. So if this worked really well, if we felt like it was a good spend of time, if we were able to, um, you know, proactively identify some of those issues. Um, you know, we might need to make some changes, um, but we would then want to implement it. Um, if it didn't work well, you'd want to kind of consider either abandoning it and starting fresh or making some significant changes. Um, so hopefully this gives you a good idea of how QI can be integrated within your infection prevention efforts. Um, and in this case, really be a little bit more proactive about identifying emerging tre trends. Um, so next, we're going to touch a little bit on action planning. Um, and so this sort of piggybacks off of what Dr. Cervantes sort of mentioned, but really having a facility plan can help support um, your quality improvement efforts. Um, and it just really helps you to identify steps to accomplish the work. So when you're completing the action plan, you just want to think about not only what you're trying to accomplish, but really you want to start by thinking about what success looks like. So you want to think about challenges um, as well as how to make changes. Um, again, another important element is kind of identifying some of those key elements, like how the change will happen, um, as well as kind of starting to identify any tools or resources that you may need that can be helpful. Um, so this is a great tool to do that. There's a lot of tools out there, but really just having sort of a, a standardized approach in terms of 
of action planning as well as documenting activities can be can be really important and help you to make those changes and implement um, changes that really make care better for our residents. Um, okay, and last but not least is sustainability. So I think infection prevention is kind of one of those places. I always like to think of that whack-a-mole game. I feel like it's one of those places where, you know, you whack one mole and another one pops up. So I think this is one of those places where sustainability is really crucial. Um, and so this is another great tool that's available. Um, this one's available from AHRQ that can help you to identify your sustainability strengths and challenges. Um, so it really takes into account some of those key elements like environmental support, organizational capacity, project outcomes, as well as strategic planning. Um, and then finally, there is a sustainability action plan on the next slide. Um, and so again, this is just another sort of action planning element, but based on the assessment results that you've received, um, you may want to identify which areas you'll focus on and what the need is within, within those domains. Um, for example, environmental support or strategic planning. So this is very similar to the previous action plan we discussed. I'm not gonna go into it in any great detail here, but you will wanna make sure that you're starting um, by developing and sort of thinking about what our SMART goals are, and that will really help you to guide your sustainability planning. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so really just in summary, um, you know, again, and Dr. Sponte has talked about this a little bit, but really the key here is continuously integrating quality improvement um, into your infection prevention efforts. So, um, like we said, I think infection prevention is an ongoing journey. So, making sure that quality improvement is a piece of that puzzle, you know, really want really makes sense. Um, again, a great way to do this is through sustainability and action planning. Action can planning can really help you to get things done in an organized and documented way. Um, sustainability can really make sure those changes you've worked really hard to make are sticking. So. Thank you guys for your time today. I really appreciate it. And um, I've loved kind of talking through some of the quality improvement elements as a piece of your infection program. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Susanna and the Nursing Home